Are you looking for a next level way to turn necks on your brass? I'm about to show you an absolutely amazing piece of machinery, the Auto Dodd. Let's check it out. Let's take a look at the tool itself, what it comes with, the accessories, and kind of some of the names of the parts so that you know what we're talking about when we get into the usage. First off, we have the actual auto dod unit itself or what is really the i dod and then the control unit is what makes it the auto dod uh, there are two ways that you can buy this unit this happens to be the fully automated version with the cnc controller on it there is a manual version which literally is the exact same thing just without the motor unit and that can be manually activated and we'll go through that because you can still use this unit in a manual sense as well uh, but uh, we are talking about the full auto dod version, which, you know, I'm just going to be honest. If you're going to spend the money for the iDod, just spend the money for the um, auto part of it because the consistency, the ease of use really ramps up. I should also start by saying that I am by no means a machinist in any capacity. I don't, I mean, aside from a, a really bad uh, mini lathe that I own, which I barely use. I, I don't do any kind of machining. Uh, my, my mini lathe is really relegated for sanding parts, more or less. Um, and so I have very little knowledge going into the use of something that is essentially a, another mini lathe. Um, although obviously it's a little more specialized. So this was definitely foreign to me. And it's one of the few times I've really kind of been intimidated to start playing with a new tool, but it really, I warmed up to it very quickly. And one of the reasons is that there is actually a really good manual and I, I'm probably worse than most people at throwing the manual to the side and just going, uh, you know, crazy on the tools before I even read anything specific about them. Uh, but I thought, you know, <laughs> I don't really know this space very well. Uh, I used to turn necks. It was with a manual. Well, it was with a like a drill powered unit, and and I did fine turning necks back then. It just it was really labor intensive and hard on my hands, and that was one of the main reasons I gave it up. Well, going to the seven PRCW that I have, it's one of those cartridges that just really benefits from uh, being neck turned. And and while the two eighty four, you know, kind of you know like the two eighty four honestly was fine shooting uh, no turn in. Uh, but uh, I really needed to get into turning necks again with the PRCW. So I went through the manual, and one thing you have to remember is that Brian Blake, the guy who owns uh, F-Class Products and, and designed this, he's constantly updating it. So the manual, as much as he tries to keep it updated, may not exactly reflect what you're looking at. And to be honest, even if you're watching this video six months from now, it may not directly look exactly the same. And that's because he's constantly trying to improve the parts and stuff like that. A buddy of mine has one of these that's maybe three or four months old. And there's a couple little, you know, minor things that have changed. He's constantly looking to improve them. And, and I think that really says a lot. And he's really good about helping you get uh, replacement parts or upgraded parts if you need them. Uh, I've heard of stories where sometimes he'll just send them to you. Obviously, if it's a, an add-on part, like when he added the uh, the whacker here, obviously that's not going to be a free part, but he's very good about saying, hey, look, this is an upgraded part. If you want to get it from me, let me know. I can tell you how to install it. So let's talk about what comes with it. And keep in mind, this is pretty much as of the video being made, everything you can order on the AutoDod unit. So we have the actual motor unit. This is this is the control, not the controller, but like the um, kind of the gear change system, and it runs the collet that's in there. And then you have the cutting head over here. You have the manual handle with the cam on it over here, and then you have the gauge that is going to show you in or out on your neck or outside cutting. You have, uh, and I'll show it up close here in a few minutes, but. Underneath here, you've got a touch sensor that is going to uh, tell you or tell it when it is made its final like end of cut because it's going to touch the shoulder. You've got the inside cutter and outside cutter. The inside cutter is essentially a boring bar, albeit a very small one. Outside one is an angled cutter, and it is specifically designed for the uh, angle of the brass that you will be using. 
One thing to keep in mind is that you can always call and talk to him or his staff, but he does have uh, in the back here a list of all the different degrees and what is usually recommended for them. Well, not usually what is recommended for them. And one other thing, I'm just going to ask for people who are machinists out there to have a little patience with me because I am going to call things, things that are probably not the exact right name, but uh, for the sake of just trying to, um, you know, make it a little easier to understand for people that buy this that aren't machinists, uh, people will understand what I'm talking about either way. Tools that he includes. I've shown this in some of my other little shorts that I've done, but he does include what are probably, well, a, a single uh, T-handle torque um, hex wrench, but uh, these things are amazing. I've never owned them before. Uh, because of this one wrench, I went out and spent like a hundred bucks buying both a metric and standard set that are now in my drawers. But, you know, he didn't have to go this high quality. He could have cheaped out, you know, and bought a, a, a 40 pack of, you know, wire, wire handle uh, wrenches. But this was a really nice touch. Uh, it gets used on a number of places here as well as just a simple Allen. And, uh, you know, there's really no necessity to have another one of these in this wrench size because this literally gets used on like one piece. So it makes sense to me why that happened that way. You're also going to get this little book reader light. And you can see it's got three levels of illumination with a little clip. It, I kind of thought it was weird that he included it, but now having had it, and understanding uh, some of the tighter confined spaces on here. It is nice if you don't have a light. Now I've got a flashlight that I keep in, in the shop here, but I think this is really nice and I keep it nearby because I use it for this and I actually use it for other stuff that I do now. So I appreciate having that. You have the, uh, the case whacker, which this is what is going to actually, if you don't have the auto whacker on here, you're gonna tap the brass out with this and it's just a heavy piece of um, it's probably not Delrin, but something very similar to it. And then you also have the ramrod, which is going to go from the back. And again, keep in mind, I'll show you how all of this works. But this is the ramrod, which is going to push your brass up into the shell holder uh, that you have. We have the, well, not shell holder, but brass holder. And then we have the brass holders themselves here. And these are going to be uh, cartridge specific. So it's really important that you work with them ahead of time because you can actually send them fired brass from your chamber and they will make you a custom one, which I think is really cool. Uh, I happen to be shooting, again, the PRCW. He has one that works really well that is uh, kind of a standardized uh, 6 5 slash 7 millimeter. It works with his 7 FCP round. It works with uh, the PRCW, stuff like that. Um, and so that is going to be... Um, you know, kind of a standardized uh, holder for you there. And I'll show you again how those work and get set up. One thing about uncrating this, and uh, it comes in this really well done, well executed wood crate that is then inside of a box. It really helps minimize the form factor. And I, I was expecting a giant box with massive padding around it uh, when this arrived. And it, it came in a much smaller box than I was expecting. In fact, it wasn't much bigger than the unit itself. But because of how he crates this up and bolts it in, uh, it, it arrived in perfect condition. So uh, zero worries. And I know he has shipped uh, nearly 400 of these uh, so far. And, uh, and so he's clearly got a handle on how to do this right. But I will tell you something that I wasn't maybe 100% clear on. And, you know, it's, it's, you know, probably my fault, but I'm just going to point it out. Uh, there's a little, it's in here and it shows you, but there is this bolt and it's going to be on the back side right here of this little cam arm and it threads in and it just helps prevent, it locks this in and keeps this from moving. And, um, you know, it's going to sound stupid, but I'm okay admitting it. There was a tag on it that says, uh, remove before use. And in my head, because of how the tag was on there, I thought it meant remove the tag not the bolt. And so I actually ran this a little bit and I was having a dragging problem. And then of course it finally occurred to me. So, you know, I'm just going to pass my mistake on to help prevent anyone else. But this screw again needs to be fully removed. So that just stays out. One other thing that I'll show you is when they build these, let me show you this little box. So this comes uh, with all of the uh, stuff that you're seeing. And when they do a build, like it's got my name on the motor, it's got my name here. And I know that's not just because it's me. I've talked to other people who have received these. 
and they they literally build a bundle and and they know who everybody's parts are that go with it so i think that's pretty cool the way they do that you're also going to get this little knitting hook again there's going to be some things that look strange but they make sense this knitting hook has, it's just the tiniest hook on the end, and it's designed to fish into brass and pull out any tailings that are in there um, or curled shavings or whatever. And so that can help pull those out. And I've used that a few times. It's been effective. You're then going to have the, um, the collet wrench, kind of, uh, we'll just call it the collet wrench, but this piece is going to go on the front of the collet. This goes on the back, and that's going to tighten the collet around your um shell holder brass holder here and then you've got a couple of these little cotton dauber things and those are great for running inside of the brass holder in the back because just the tiniest little piece that gets in there uh you know you could end up scratching your brass or it could end up keeping the brass from going forward all the way and i use this um you know fairly often just to during my process to make sure i'm cleaning it out in there so uh, that is great to have as well. So that's everything that comes in it. I don't think there was anything else that really of, of note. There's there's a couple of the plastic holders, but those are just what the cutters came in. But they, they come already installed. But if you're going to swap those out, they do provide you the plastic holders. And he does put in a couple of cool stickers. So that's the, that's the accessories that come with it. Again, it comes with a really nice manual that I'd recommend you go through before using it, whether you think you're experienced, experienced or not. Um, it does pay to go through this. And then uh, as far as the actual control unit goes, so here's your actual uh, CNC controller. You have the emergency stop or you twist it to turn it on. You have the, um, the nine pin, what is it? Uh, yeah, nine pin. Uh, that the actual uh, cutter, the actual IDOT is going to plug into. You then have a power cord for this box, and it's going to possibly come with this adapter on it, as mine did. And you can just pay no attention to this. This just pulls off and is going to plug into here. So you're going to plug that in for power. This one is going to plug into the 9-pin to run as a controller. And then there is kind of this Cat5 looking connection over here also from the IDOD that is going to plug into the side. On the controller itself, you have the start stop like we talked about. You have the, um, this is the rapid, what he calls the rapid position. So this on the left is going to control how fast the head approaches what you could call its starting point for the cutting. And it's just to reduce time per cut because if it ran at one speed, there's, you know, there could be maybe an inch or three quarters of an inch of take up that you're waiting for it before it finally hits the brass. So what you can do with this is actually tune it. So the cutter is going to kind of whoop, get really close and then it starts on the feed speed, which is over on this side. So you want to work with these two and how far your brass sticks out is going to also affect where you set this. So if you are using different uh, shell holders and stuff like that, you want to make um, you want to make sure that, uh, that if you put a new one in, that you're adjusting this so that you're not slamming the, the cutters into the brass because you don't want to do that. And once I have this up and running and show you how it works, it'll make more sense. We also have just a plain eject button. So this is for the, uh, the ejector whacker here, and that's just going to smack the brass and knock it out the back. And then the reset button is going to stop the cutter head wherever it is and move it back and then eject. And then start is going to be for each movement of cutting a neck. So you're gonna put a piece of brass in, you're going to hit start, it's going to do its thing, it's going to come back, and then it's gonna wait for you to hit start again. So that covers all that. We do have some uh, lights here. You have a touch sensor, a home position, and a limit activated. Uh, and it's it's engraved, it's hard to see in the video, but the touch sensor is going to be right here and that is on the cutting head and that's what's going to hit the shoulder and that is going to stop it. And that's if you have the touch sensor option, which I would highly, highly recommend. And then you have the uh, home position, which is when it's all the way in the rear here, so all the way back. And then you have the limit activated, which is actually another sensor that I can't really show you, but it's it's right here and it's a little spring toggle, right? It kind of looks like this. And so if this gets too close, it closes the gap on that 
and it prevents this from crashing into uh, anything over here, whether it's the shell holder or, uh, you know, like overcutting and trashing a piece of brass or whatever it is. So it's going to prevent too much motion that way. So that's everything that is on the controller unit. As we work around here, we've got the manual handle that I've shown you here. We have the uh, the actual cutting head. Now this one is the uh, replaceable one. So if you have multiple cartridges with four simple screws, you can replace the entire head without messing with any of your settings, put in a different one for a different cartridge and then run with it. I can also tell you this will come into play with other uh, really cool stuff that he has planned for this machine. So being able to remove this tool head is really cool. On the tool head itself, you're going to have, this is uh, going to set your touch sensor, so how forward or back of cutting it is. So that's how, you, that's how you're going to directly adjust how far, like maybe onto the shoulder or into the neck you want to do. You have on the back here, you have a little uh, dial with a set screw and then uh, a couple of other set screws right here on, on this side. That's gonna hold your outside cutter and adjust it. The inside, the kind of the boring bar, are these two set screws here. And there's no micro adjuster because you don't really need it for the boring bar. If you need to make an adjustment, then you can just loosen these and move it a little bit. But um, really the outside one is the only one that really dictates needing a real fine micro adjust because if you micro adjust both, then you're just, mm, it's, it's just, it's needless energy wasted. You're going to set, what, what we're going to do is we're going to set the inside boring bar first and then micro adjust the outside. So it's very simple. Uh, we talked about the whacker here that is going to snap the brass out. And one thing that people have said is, oh, well, you know, isn't this piece of aluminum going to damage your necks? I can tell you I've done nearly a thousand pieces of brass now. And, uh, and I really wanted to make sure that I, I had a chance to understand and really get used to this before I did this video. But uh, I have yet to have a piece of brass that's been damaged from this thing. And, and you know, it's whacked nearly a thousand pieces of brass at this point. Keep in mind, it is softer aluminum and that's so that it doesn't damage anything. And, you know, it's not uncommon for it to get a couple of marks from the cases. I mean, it is repeatedly hitting the case mouse. So you will see a little bit of scratching and stuff on the front. Again, totally normal uh, from that standpoint. You've got your cords that we talked about. We have the um, the dial over here, and that's going to be used in conjunction with this right here. And that's going to move the entire cutter head this way or you know, forward or back. And that's, again, going to help set your inside cut or outside cut. You can actually tweak it just a little bit from that perspective. And then the motor unit, there's really not much to it, and you really don't want to mess with this. There is the power switch that is right there. So that's gonna simply turn it on and off. And then right here, and he's got a big giant label that says starter boost button. You can do this to help kind of get it up and running. I have not had a need, but again, I've only been using this in uh, spring to summer, you know, more summer uh, type conditions. So it's always been at least 50, 60, 70 degrees in my garage here. If you are in a really cold environment or if this has been stored in a very cold environment, then what can happen, and I've seen this with other machines I've had, is all of the um, the lube or grease that is inside of the motor units can kind of just harden up just a little bit because it hasn't, it's not hot enough to be working and you need to get that motor turned over. That's going to help it just get fired up. And again, as it says, use this button to give short boost to the motor when motor does not start at full speed. Button should only be held for enough time until it hits full speed, which is about two to 10 seconds. Use only if the machine is cold. After it warms up, it's not needed for starting. So this is a uh, rarely use or only as needed, not in every time. Uh, I have been turning this unit off, but I've also been finding that just because of what it does, I do unplug it when I'm not using it because it doesn't get used all the time and I would hate to actually turn it on and ruin something. I also find that I unplug this and put it away with the unit because again, I don't want to rip the cord or the power or anything, um, you know, accidentally. We will show it when uh, running this, but uh, for anybody that does machining, you have a far better understanding of this than I do, but as, as an idiot machinist right now, I will tell you that this feed uh, speed is going to be one of the most critical things about the auto dod that sets it apart from anything else 
in terms of manually adjusting this. And that's because you can set the speed and feed and make really fine adjustments for how thick your neck wall is. And so if you speed up the feed, it'll cut differently than cutting slowly. It'll put different marks, you know, like if you go really fast, it, it, it may not get a whole cut. If you go really slow, it can actually have opposite effects. And so uh, it, it's very interesting to work with these speeds. And I will say that, I think it even says in the instructions and from, from my other friends that have them, uh, typically with both the lines pointing roughly to 10 or 11 o'clock seems to be the general consensus for the cartridges that I typically shoot, which would be like PRC right now. And then my buddy has a 284 and it's roughly the same. Uh, you know, this, this one is more likely to change based on how far your, your brass is going to stick out than anything else. But, um, but like pretty much everything I've done has been sort of in this range. I am going to ruin some brass showing you the differences here, but, um, you know, there's that. Uh, before we get started with anything else, uh, I think it's just important to note that this is a really fast spinning motor. It is no different than any hazards that come with a regular lathe. Uh, it's really easy to get complacent around high speed motors. And all I can tell you is that you've got a motor or, you know, you've got something spinning on this side and this side, and you need to make sure you keep anything that could get tangled up in it out of the way. So let me just make sure that that's clear. All right, now that you've seen what is part of it, let's take a look at the actual usage. Before we get up and close with some of the setup procedures, let me just go over the general procedure that is recommended in terms of the steps that you're going to take to get this set up properly. Again, keep in mind, everything I'm going to show you is to do a 100% cut on the inside of the neck and 100% on the outside of the neck. There are certainly different methodologies to turning necks. I've seen plenty of people do a skim coat. Uh, you might do a skim coat on the inside, a full cut on the outside, a full cut inside, skim coat outside. Like there's a lot of different ways and a lot of different reasons you would do that. I'm not gonna get into any of that right now. For the purposes of this video, I'm gonna show you how to set this up so that you get a clean inside cut on 100% of the metal and a clean outside cut on 100% of the metal, including down on to the shoulder itself. So the first thing, because we're dealing with a mechanized unit moving forward, the very first thing you're gonna wanna do, and I know it's exciting, you're gonna wanna plug everything in and get it running, but we have to get the stop sensor or the limit sensor on the back side here, and you can hear it clicking, okay? And it is a simple toggle switch, and I'll show you how to get that set up, but that's the first thing we're gonna do. Then we're gonna want to install our case holder, and then we are going to set up the touch sensor. We're gonna set up the inside cutter, and then lastly, the outside cutter. And um, we're going to roughly set up uh, the, 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 the limit, or the touch sensor here, rather. Uh, and then it's going to get fine-tuned once we get running, but we definitely want to make sure that we set the inside cutter before we set the outside cutter. And the inside cutter is going to be set with this dial and with this gauge right here so that we can see where we are moving it. Uh, on the pad itself here, there is the touch sensor light we talked about, the home position and the limit activated. Uh, it is a red light, meaning bad. If you get the limit activated, that means something has gone further than it should and the limit sensor is preventing any kind of damage. You do not want to see this limit activated light come on at any time during normal operation. If you have everything set up properly, this red light should not come on. The green light is going to be the home position. We talked about that. That's when the carriage is all the way returned back. Nothing will function on this box unless that home sensor is actually activated. And then we have the touch sensor that we talked about, which is the one that is going to hit the shoulder itself. So let me get up close. Let me show you exactly how we're going to set everything up. And this will give you a great starting point so that you can start turning some premium brass. Before we get started on the actual setup, let me just cover a couple things real quickly. You're about to watch me do the setup utilizing the CNC box. And that's because for me, 
Uh, just getting started, I wanted the machine, uh, and, and in setting it up, I want the machine to operate and to cut the way that I would be using it. Now, I will tell you that if you talk to or call for help, they will tell you that if you want to kind of jumpstart your settings, the quickest and fastest way is to put a piece of brass in, do your setting adjustments like I'm going to show you, but just utilize the hand wheel instead. Uh, you'll see me using the CNC box, and that involves it going in and out and kicking the brass out. And it does take a little bit longer that way. So you are fully capable of using the hand wheel, and that will help keep you from going too far into the next potentially or, you know, trimming more than you want to. Uh, it might take you, a, a, you know, less brass in order to do it that way. The other thing that you'll notice is that there are... Uh, there's this set screw, this set screw, and then this one. Now, technically, you're going to see me take all three of these out, make an adjustment, and tighten all three down. Again, it's, it's just an abundance of caution that I'm moving it the right way. I will tell you that this screw is nylon tipped, and really, uh, once it's set, it just applies a little bit of tension, and you don't really have to mess with it. Uh, these two screws are really the ones that hold that outside cutter in place. And technically, again, you don't even have to tighten this one while you're making your initial adjustments. You can just cinch down this front one. It does help expedite things. I, you know, I'm showing you like the entire setup. I just want everyone to be aware there are some ways that you can sort of shortcut this. So with that said, let's get started on setting it up. So this is the limit sensor back here and you can see it. Um, it is this little 3D printed box and it has a little switch here. You can see it clicking. Now, the simple adjustment on this is you can bend it, but you gotta be careful if you're gonna bend it. And I, I don't know that I would necessarily recommend it even though he talks about it in the manual. Just make sure you're really careful about holding one end of this while you bend the other so that you're not snapping it off at the fulcrum there. So this is, this is what's going to stop it. Now, you can see right here, there are three screw holes so front and back. Uh, the factory setting was in the middle one. I have found that that works fine, but I just wanted to show you in case you have to make an adjustment one way or the other, this is what it looks like underneath that uh, limit sensor. Now, the way that I tested is I made the assumption and I had played with it that when I put in one of these case holders, that it's going to be flush with the collet that holds it here. So what that tells me is that I don't want to crush or crash this any further. It doesn't, it needs to stop before it hits, hits that there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put it right here. That's a little bit hard right there. So I'm going to run it once and you're going to see that it'll stop before it goes in. Now that is right on the edge of, of being really close. I could probably bend that out a little bit, but one little trick that I did is I took a post-it note. And I suppose you could take any little piece of paper that you wanted. And I simply held it right here in front of the hole and I'm gonna run it and I felt to see if this any of this touched it, okay? And I know it's not the most scientific, but you get the idea. And you can see that it did not touch the paper. I didn't feel it touching. And the other thing that I'm doing is I'm watching on the box over here to make sure that the red light hits before the blue light of the touch sensor. So if I have this post-it note in there and I see the touch sensor come up, well, that tells me we haven't hit the limit sensor. So I really wanted to make sure that that's the part that is, you know, that that sensor is getting hit before any of the post-it note gets touched. So for me, that said, well, I know this can't crash any further than the opening of the collet. And so from that standpoint, when I put one of these in, uh, I just have to make sure that the front of this, uh, well, that's the front, but I just have to make sure that the front of this doesn't go 
forward of that collet or else I could risk crashing into this. Ask me how I know. So uh, that is setting up the touch sensor. Let's move on to the next component. Now that we have our case holder that we know is the right one, this happens to be the fired PRCW, I am going to need to insert it. Now, I have a, a piece on the back I'm gonna be messing with and a piece on the front that I'm gonna be messing with. I'm gonna do my best to show you the entire process here. In fact, let me help bring this down a little bit. You can see the front of the collet here. And what he provides is he provides this metal plate with three little spikes on it. Well, not really spikes, but little, uh, I don't know, little flares that stick out. I don't know what else to call them. But anyway, they are designed to fit into the face. So on the face of the collet, and you can just sort of see it here, you've got uh, a, a opening, right? Because the collet flares open, and then when we tighten it, it's going to close up. So this has just a little bit of an opening, and we are trying to fit these three pieces into it. Now, this was a little challenging for me in the beginning. I'm not going to lie. I, I could get, you know, maybe one of the little keys, you know, key locks in. I couldn't get a really solid fit. And then what I figured out is you have to uh, angle it. And I'll, I'll kind of show you like this. You have to angle it forward just a little bit. And then from the back side, I'm going to be turning the piece that holds. The, and you can see that the collet is turning there. Okay. So what I'm going to do, and I'm going to do my best not to completely block the camera here, is I'm putting this at just a little bit of an angle, and I'm turning the back side until this locks in. Now this is a little more challenging on camera, but right there. So see how it's held up in place now? And on the back side, over here, this is the piece that I was turning. So now that I have that front metal piece wedged, so the one over here, it's wedging that whole front side so it can't move. Now I'm going to take this piece, which is, it just looks like a simple piece of metal, but it has been milled down to specifically fit into the little holes on the back side. Okay, so that's what I'm going to want to do. So here's the procedure. Let me come back over here on this side. We're going to move this out of the way. I want to, first off, make sure this is loose. Okay, so I'm, I'm making this really loose. I'm going to put my case holder in and I'm gonna push it back and I'm gonna make sure that it's flush, okay? Now, if that means taking something and you know physically pushing like that, great. Whatever works for you to make sure that you are flush. I happen to be just right at flush or a hair under. If you need to adjust it, I found uh, that I just had a, a brush sitting around. This works phenomenal for pushing the actual case holder out from the back. You can see if I do that, see how it comes out. This can be a little challenging to pull out on its own. So I just use the back end of a brush, plus the brush is nice for uh, cleaning everything. So there you go. Uh, so I'm flush here. I want to just hand tighten it while I'm holding this to make sure that that case holder stays where it's supposed to. Now I'm going to take my locking plate and put it on and I'm going to get it locked in there so it's under pressure. Now, from this side, we are going to take this and we are going to stick it in and we are going to tighten. So now that is really nice and snug. No issues there and uh, we should be good to go. That gets you your case holder nice and locked in. We now remove this Make sure you remove that. And now we're good to go. So I can give this a spin and just see. All right, everything looks good there. Now that we have the case holder in, we need to make sure that we get everything set up on the tool head here properly. First thing to keep in mind is that we talked about these two dials. This is going to be the rapid position. This is going to be the feed rate. So the rapid position is how fast does this move forward, right, before it stops and begins the machining process, which is then dictated by the adjustment on the right side, which is the feed rate. So rapid gets it really close, then the feed does the actual machining time. You just don't want it to crash in. To give you an idea, I'm on number four here. That means it's going to stop about an inch from the front out to here, 
okay? If you put it on one, it's not designed to stop until about a quarter inch. That would, I mean, I can't see where that wouldn't crash something or hit the limit sensor, but uh, I would definitely say start on the bigger end, start on five, six, seven, and then work your way in. That way, I mean, one, you're not gonna ruin as much brass that way. And two, you run risk uh, less risk of damaging any of your, your cutters or anything else that's going on. So what do we need? Well, we need to get going with a piece of brass. Here we have our, our willing volunteer. And uh, this has been shot once, which I like turning brass after it's been shot once. And I am going to put it in the back. Okay, so we're gonna stick it in the hole. And then we're just gonna shove it in like this and then tap it in, one, two, three. You know, just give it a couple, a couple good hits. You wanna make sure that it is nice and tight when it goes in the hole, because if it's too loose, the cutter heads can actually push the brass backwards, which is when you're really gonna be glad that you have that limit sensor, okay? Now, ideally in the safest possible world, you're gonna wanna put the brass in when this unit isn't turning. I can just tell you, I don't know anybody who does that. However, in the interest of safety, I'm just telling you, put it in when it's turned off. So let's get it turned on. And then what we're going to do is we're going to back off. So this is set up. I'm gonna destroy my setting for you guys, but let's let's back off the outside cutter. So push, when you whenever you wanna go that way, away from cutting with the outside cutter, you need to make sure you apply some pressure because it's not connected to anything on the micrometer over here. So this, this little dial here, you wanna push and then dial backwards and that's going to give me clearance. Now I can uh, just set, set this down here, okay? Now only the inside sh uh, cutter should cut. And so what I wanna do is I wanna take an inside cut only and that's going to be adjusted again by this. And there's this handy dial up here, which is going to tell you if you go clockwise, that is going to move the entire carriage um, uh, away from you. And when it goes counterclockwise, it's going to come towards you. So towards you will cut more of the neck on the inside and away from you is going to cut the outside of the neck. So uh, where we have it set, I'm just gonna take a, a, a quick run with it here. Now you can see my, my rapid position stopped a little early. I'll turn it down a little bit. I, left it turned up and it's taking just a little bit of an outside cut so I did not turn that back enough so in this particular case you know it's not the end of the world because it took like basically a skim cut you know you can see it cut part of one side is definitely thicker on the outside there than on this side uh, but the inside, there are definitely, it is still a little bit of a skim cut too. I moved this just a hair so that we'd get that look. And it's going to be nearly impossible to show you on camera right now. But what you're looking for is either what looks like kind of like raw metal or exposed metal or dull metal or like a shadow almost. And if I had a light or something that, and, and I was, you know, and you're looking in person, it's certainly a lot easier, you know, to see all of this that's in there. But I can tell you just looking at this, there's a big shadowy spot right in this part of the neck. And I can guarantee you that needs to be cut more. So how do we cut that more? Well, we need to turn this dial and we want to bring the entire carriage towards me. So that means uh, making the dial go counterclockwise. So let's turn this a little bit. And I've, I've set this to zero. So I knew where we were starting. And then we're going to we're gonna go one notch forward, okay? Now, one other thing to keep in mind is this dial can move. You'll see it fluctuate while it's during the machining process. You want to only make adjustments when it's back in the home position here, okay? So back in the home position, make your adjustment and then test it out. So let's shove our brass back in, okay? And we're gonna give this a run. So let me take a look here again. It's going to be really tough on camera, but all right, that looks clean. Now I still have, I still have some neck in here that didn't get cut. It's a pretty big spot, like right there. So 
what I want to do is come another uh, another notch here, which I, is in a thousandths, but right. right there. So we're gonna, gonna take that. Okay, let's see what we can do with it now. I can hear it just taking a little bit more. All right. And, you know, the, the fewer steps you take, the more brass you're going to preserve in the process from being damaged. All right, this looks gorgeous. Again, I know you can't see it, but that giant, I had a giant, you know, bare spot from where it wasn't cutting. And it is now, it looks gorgeous. So, I just want to take the least amount of metal off the inside so that I get a complete cut. And I feel really good about that. So now we can leave, um, uh, we can just leave this setting done. So what I want to do now is take this dial and I'm going to move it to zero. Now I know that if for some reason I hit this or whatever happens, I've got my zero point. Now we need to take care of the outside cutter. So if you, there's two ways, there's two ways to get started with the outside cutter. One is if you don't know where the position is at all, you can put a piece of brass in, okay? And then we can move the cutter forward and I can loosen up these screws, okay? And then I can just slowly turn this till I feel resistance. Right about there. Now I wanna back it off just a hair, so I'm putting my finger in here to push, again, push some resistance against this, this dial, and I'm gonna back it off just a little bit. And now we are going to go ahead and tighten this down. Okay. And then we're gonna run it, and let's see what the outside looks like. Oh, that might be too much. Oh, did you see how the brass pushed? So the brass pushed a little bit. I did not hit it in there strong enough. Okay. Let's take a look at this outside. Now the outside, that is that is uh, really nice on the outside. The shoulder, I don't love how the shoulder looks and, and I can still see a little bit of like shadowing on there, okay. So I want to bring this out just a little bit. So we're going to loosen this up. Putting resistance against the cutting head. Now I'm going to turn just a little bit. Okay. And then we're going to go ahead and tighten this down. And there is a flat spot on the top of this cutter. When you tighten these, it aligns the cutter so that it, it's sitting where it should. That way the cutter can't get off kilter. Okay. Now I want to I want to use this same piece of brass for now just to get the outside cut. Oh, there it is. Uh, I just want to see if I can get rid of these shadows, and then I'll move on to another piece, uh, like a new piece of brass. So now we took way too much off of the actual shoulder and that's fine. We'll adjust that. And I can feel it with my thumbnail. So that, that definitely tells me that, that we're taking way too much. But what I'm looking for right now is this outside cut and I still don't love it. So I want to take just a little bit more and this, you know, this takes a little bit of time and it's going to take some brass, you know, buddies of mine who are machinists, you know, they, they can do this in a couple pieces of brass. It took me about a dozen the first time I did it. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just be prepared for whatever your experience level is. And I'm going to run this brass one more time, and then we're going to use a piece of virgin, well, not virgin, but uncut brass. 
Oh, there we go. Well, that definitely crashed. It didn't, it didn't crash, but the stop sensor, the limit sensor hit. So yeah, I, I, I really need to adjust that. All right, so that's where we're at with that piece. Now I'm gonna stick another piece in here. We're gonna make sure this taps in. Apparently I'm not hitting it hard enough, probably because I'm making a video here, but let's get this running. So now we're gonna see the whole process on a piece of brass that hasn't been cut yet. So yeah, that, that's cutting way too much onto the, onto the neck and you saw it kind of froze up for a second. So less than ideal. Again, I moved everything out of, out of alignment so that I could walk you through the process. Since we have so much shoulder being cut, I'm just gonna put a stop to that right now. And that's with this little dial right here. And that's gonna move the touch sensor forward or back. So what I wanna do is I wanna move that touch sensor forward, which means I'm going to screw it clockwise, which pushes the block out, okay? So I'm gonna give that, you know, a couple, three, four, five turns there. And we're going to put another piece of brass in. Now, one thing that I could do right now this one cut, and I don't know, uh, let me see if I've got, where is it? Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me, let me just see, I can at least test where that, how far off that outside cutter is here. So right now the neck wall thickness is 10 thousandths. That's thinner than I would ideally like. I, it's hard when you're cutting inside and outside because you would like to get, uh, you know, have as little metal taken off as possible. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and back off the outside cutter again real quick, just a little bit. The trick, like anytime you're cutting brass, is to make sure that on uncut brass you're getting the results. You know, you can stack some bad tolerances when you keep cutting like I did there and uh, it doesn't always work out in your favor. So I'm gonna back off about a quarter turn there. And let's see here. Let's get another piece of brass. Now, ideally, and there's a piece of brass that didn't push out all the way, so let's get that out of there. Okay, so here is a piece of uncut brass unturned. Now, in theory, oh, it didn't finish all the way. So sometimes if it doesn't, if it doesn't reset all the way, uh, you may have to hit the reset button. That time I just forgot to turn it on. Now it's barely cutting the, the shoulder at this point. So it barely went down on the shoulder, so we can fix that. Now I wanna measure that neck wall thickness. And I am at 12, 12 thousandths. So I'm gonna go just a little bit more. If I can be at 13 thousandths, I'll be really happy. Mainly because I don't wanna to take too much metal the first time I cut this. I, you know, There's a good chance with the way this PRC brass lasts, there is a very good chance that I'm gonna to have to turn once or twice more over the life of this brass. The, my brass has been going at least 13, 14 firings, so there is that. Okay, now I'm gonna take another piece of brass. I could use that old one, I suppose, but I'm just gonna work on another un, unturned one. It's definitely taking less metal on the outside, but still a good clean cut. You notice that the, the brass didn't come flying out. So sometimes what I'll do is I'll hit it back in and then just hit the eject button and it'll kick it out. And let's see what we're looking at here. Oh, this is a great example. I've got I've got a little bit of brass inside and you can see if I use this, I can I can knock it loose and then drop it out. So let's see how thick 
this is. So now I'm right at 13, 13 and a half, 13. Let me turn it a little bit. 13, okay, so 13. Now 13 is just barely, just barely not cutting. So there's two options for this. Well, there's actually a couple options. One is I can change my feed rate, which will control how slow it goes. And if I were to, I'll, I'll use this as an example. I'm gonna put this back in. I'm gonna turn my feed rate down a couple numbers. I was on four. I'm gonna go to two, okay? So this is one option. The slower you go, the more it's going to cut. There is a there is a fine line, and he describes it in the manual about being too low on the feed rate, though, and you can end up with some opposite problems. So it did cut just a little bit more, but this is definitely something where you'd want to make an adjustment. Now, I know the neck wall thickness is what I want, okay? So if the neck wall thickness is pretty much what I want, and I'm going to go back up to my three and a half on the feed rate. So the neck wall thickness was right at 13 where I wanted it. So what are my options? Well, what I could do is move this dial just a little bit um, towards, uh, away, I'm sorry, away from me. And uh, that is going to cut a little more on the outside and just a hair less on the outside. So let's move it just a little bit. Okay. Now I'm gonna take a piece, of, another, another brand new piece of brass. Really, really close, and I'm not seeing not seeing any issues on the inside. So I'm gonna go just a just a skosh more so that I'm cutting cutting the outside just a little bit more and the inside just a little bit less. There's just a just a hair. What I'm gonna do? I have just a little bit more room to work with. It looks like so. I'm gonna I'm gonna go just a, just a hair out. All right. So I think I'm gonna be happy with that setting right there. Now what I need to do is adjust how far down the shoulder it goes. So right now it's basically stopping right at the shoulder junction. I don't want that. I want it to come down. I just don't want it to be obscene like this one is here. So how am I gonna do that? Well, we're gonna go back to this. I want to now bring the touch sensor in a little bit, and that means unscrewing it so that it moves it that direction. And that's gonna let it cut a little further. And I'm gonna still gonna use that same piece of brass now because the shoulder is what I'm after. So if I'm gonna ruin a piece of brass, I'm gonna do it smartly. bit more. Getting close. It's almost starting to work down the shoulder. Oh yeah, there we go. Now, I'm not a believer in taking too much shoulder material. I wanna take enough shoulder material 
that I'm gonna prevent or help prevent the donuts from coming back too quickly, right? Because that shoulder material is what is working its way in and becoming donuts. So part of the reason for doing this is we want to eliminate those donuts. Now that is, that is just barely enough. I'm gonna come out just a hair more. I wanna go down the shoulder just a little bit more. There we go. Now that's looking good. So yeah, that's, that's what I'm looking for. Nice and clean. And then usually what I do is I'm gonna take another piece of brass cause it's a good sharp edge. And I wanna feel like, I don't want to really feel that transition between where it's cut and where it's uncut. If you feel a step, like, hear that click? There, it's definitely cutting in way too much there. I want it to be a nice, smooth transition right here. So I have to really fight to feel that. So that's, that's perfect. Like, I'm really, really liking that. Now I am noticing that the inside, let me throw my glasses back on here. So inside's looking great. I'm happy with the inside, it's cutting good. Outside, I have just a little bit showing. So at this point, I like where everything is set up. I'm going to move my dial to zero and I'm going to move this outside cutter just a skosh. Yes, that's an official term. Holding against the blade, I want to turn. That's about an eighth. Eighth of a turn there. Okay, we're gonna tighten this down. And we're gonna run one last willing volunteer here. This should be exactly what I'm looking for. Clean on the outside, great down the shoulder. Inside looks good. Let's measure this neck wall, <laughs> neck wall thickness. So I know I made a slight adjustment, which is okay. It's putting me right at, or just a hair under 13. So it didn't take much to clean up that outside and I'm still really happy with that. So let's call it 12 and a half to 13. You know, I mean, you're literally splitting hairs. I mean, a human hair is five thousandths, so uh, half a thousandths. I mean, you're, you're splitting less than a hair. So that's really good. Now, that is your setup. I, I know that it's a little time consuming to watch. Hopefully, this will help you speed it up. Uh, now we're going to move on to a little bit of the, let's call it cleaning or, you know, minor problem solving. That is the basic operation of the unit. So you've seen me take brass, you've seen me uh, first work on the inside, then we work on the outside, then we work on the shoulder. We now have everything working in unison so that we can turn beautiful brass. In fact, I'll show you a really nice picture here that shows you, uh, you know, this was some brass that I did not long ago. Just look at how clean, how consistent it all is. And I, I really think that this shows you the capability of what this machine can do for you. So, uh, you know, I'll just run a couple pieces of brass while we're standing here, just so you can see it in operation. just it's amazing how good of a job this thing does so let's talk about other things that have to do with turning necks one of the things that people might be looking at and when they watch this video is the fact that i'm not using any kind of of turning fluid of any kind so because of how this machine works you're not dealing with a mandrel you're not really you know like 
you're not putting the brass under extreme heat like you do when you're turning on a mandrel. So when it's on a mandrel and, and, and your brass is on it, there's a ton of friction that can heat up, expand, cause weird cutting errors, stuff like that. Uh, Brian will even tell you, like, they don't use any kind of turning fluid. That being said, I have found, and this is a gentleman that reached out to me quite a while ago, and now 21st Century is carrying this, but it's called Delta Turning Lube. It is not an oil. It is like a, a water-based, I don't even know what it is, poly something. He's got a fancy technical name for it. And a buddy of mine uses it. Uh, he still turns on a mandrel, and he, he swears by this stuff. Uh, I have used it a little bit, and I'm just going to show you. I've got it in a in a syringe that um, you know you can just drop uh, drop right onto um, your brass if you want to. You can use a little dropper bottle, whatever it is that works for you. It doesn't take much, and in fact, you can uh, sit there and actually put it in a little cup, and you can uh, do that with it. So we're going to stick that in. And it does a beautiful job of protecting the metal. You know, anytime you have single point cutting, which is what you're doing here, uh, you're going to have some amount of heat that builds up. And I would be lying if I said that the cut isn't just ever so much better by using turning fluid. Um, this lasts forever. Like this, this is a ton of, of cleaning fluid for what you need to do. And I've actually just taken the lid and then filled it up and then dipped the necks in it as I'm using it, and, and it's great. Um, I have also used it for expanding necks. It doesn't work as good for expanding necks, but for turning, it is 100% fantastic, and it doesn't leave any weird residue or anything like that. So, um, you know, if that's something that you're looking for, I'd definitely give that a try. Uh, other than that, here's other things you need to be careful of. Obviously, you've got residue down here. Uh, you're going to want to make sure that you brush that or vacuum it out of the way. You're going to have little shreds that are on the cutter. And you would think, okay, well, you know, uh, the, the cutter is harder than brass, so I don't really have to worry about keeping this too clean because it would just cut right through these to get through the other brass. Well, you can actually run into some very minor problems with uh, grooving if you don't keep your cutter heads clean. So I am I am pretty good about making sure that I brush that off every couple cuts. So that can happen. The other thing that can happen, and it's rare, but the brass when it's in here, okay, so I'm gonna put it in. So the brass when it's in here, if a little piece of brass ends up on the outside and then it gets whacked, right? Then what's gonna happen is a little piece of brass could end up on the inside of this. And so what I have found is using their little uh, brush or you know, little cotton dauber here. So periodically, if I'm having an issue, I'll just take this dauber while it's running and just run it in like that. And it just, I mean, it just, it just takes it right out. So a, a great use for that, that little cotton dauber there. The whacker, as we talked about, uh, that can sometimes not eject the brass if it's too tight. Uh, if it ejects it partially, then you can either knock it back in and then hit the eject button again, that'll knock it out. Or if it is um, something that you prefer to do, you could shut the machine off and then use like the, the cotton dauber again to push out that way. I talked about using uh, my brush as a, a pusher to get out the case holders. I still think that's about the best trick. I don't want to use anything metal that could scratch the inside. Again, because we're knocking brass in and out, if we create a hot spot in there, it's going to make a mark on everything we do. And, well, we don't want that. So the brass is nice. It catches just enough of the edge of this to knock it out so that you're safe there. Uh, other than that, there aren't too many things that happen. I do vacuum this with my shop vac uh, periodically. A lot of times when I'm when I'm doing it here, what I'll do is I'll just kind of brush it onto the um, onto the bench here, and then it'll make a big pile. And then when I'm all done, I can vacuum it up. If I really feel like it needs vacuuming, I can do that as well. I talked about how when I'm storing this, I do disconnect all the cables, uh, even though you know it's a nice unit and it it does sit you know it's, it's attached pretty securely. I don't want anything to accidentally rip a cable out or something, and, and maybe that's just my paranoia, but because this doesn't get used all the time, 
Uh, I just want to know that this is safe where it's being stored. So again, I disconnect all three cables and then store the box, you know, kind of behind it. And then I put a pillowcase over it to protect it. There really isn't too much more for this other than Brian has promised some really cool add-ons like I talked about. I, I know that there's a feeder unit coming for auto uh, processing. That's going to be I don't know. I don't, I don't know any other process that is going to get more people excited about an auto feed than, uh, than this. I mean, it's, it's pretty amazing. I also know that there are some other trimming functions that might be coming. There might be some bullet pointing stuff. He's, he's teased a bunch of stuff on Facebook. I would love to see it all come to fruition because really it turns this, which this is a sizable investment. I'm not going to lie. I mean, you're looking, you know, somewhere between two and $3,000 to, build it out uh, like you see here or you know minus a few parts this and that depending on how you want to put it together but really what it turns it into is a really advanced brass prep station at that point uh, and then if it can do other things on top of that like so I think it's really smart that he's trying to make this into a an actual you know machine rather than just a neck turning tool so if it's a machine that can do a bunch of different things, I think that gives it a lot more utility and it obviously makes it more cost effective for somebody looking to jump in on it. Uh, I don't really have too much else to say about it. Uh, I do know that his customer service is absolutely amazing. If you have a problem, if you can't get something to work, uh, you can call. They will walk you through it. They will help you out. Uh, I, I've seen countless, countless, countless uh, threads on Accurate Shooter with people talking about the customer service they've had over at uh, F-Class products for any number of things, whether it's their dyes or uh, this or, you know, any of the other products that they make. So uh, with that, I don't have too much else. I think that if you are in the market, if this is something that is in your budget and you want the absolute best way to turn next, that honestly, it's just the easiest thing once you get it set up. Uh, give the IDOD or AutoDOD a, a chance. So I appreciate everybody watching. You have a good one. We'll talk soon.